preaching on Friday night. So I need to know. <laughs> oh, everybody wants to pretend like they're still shaking hands and clap. Everybody wants to pretend like they're distracted. You ain't fooling me. I wait. You got it? You want some water? Uh, 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 first of all, while we're getting ready, by getting situated, thinking I'm going to move on, I ain't. I want to welcome Sister Kat. It's so good to see you. Praise the Lord. You're moving back from Phoenix. She's going to be back in the Gallup area. Praise the Lord. It's good to see you, Valia. Thank you, Jesus, and your baby. Praise the Lord. Things getting big, huh? Did I just call it a thing? That child is getting so big. Praise the Lord. They grow like weeds. Take lots of pictures because they grow. Okay, now they've got everybody's returning. Who knows the memory verse? And Anita can't do it. Who else is the one that said they knew it? This, this is not raising your hand, Sister Cheyenne. This is picking your nose or rubbing your head or something. This is, I got an itch on the middle of my brow. You know it? Okay, try it. Did you get what part did you stop? I say the Lord the thoughts of peace and not evil. Is that what you said? You said that part. That's not bad. Clap for her. She did pretty good. That's an effort. Now you know I took a picture of all y'all. Next, so this coming Sunday, I am going to go into the phone and look to see who clapped their hand or who rose their hand. Raise your hand if you rose your hand on the camera two weeks ago. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so one of y'all better learn it because I'm going to go on the phone and I'm going to call you out. I'm trying to make you nervous. I am pressuring you now. I'm, I'm giving the kind of pressure I haven't given in the past. And you know why it's okay? Because I haven't done it in the past. I am going to pressure you. That is my job. My job is to push you, but not so far that you fall down but that you are motivated and encouraged to learn your scripture. Can I get amen? Oh, that was quiet. <laughs> the last part is, then shall you call upon me and you shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken on to you. This is important. This should motivate you to pray. So this is a very important verse of scripture. I need you to learn it, study it, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Just think, just, you know, you know what you need to do? Write on a card. Write it on a flash card. This coming Sunday, I'm going to find out who really focuses on the, on the Lord when they're not in church. Because maybe that's more of what we need. What I want you to do, I want for all the people that want to get serious about God and about the Word, I want you to take Jeremiah 29 11, and I want you to put it on a flash card and carry it with you. Look at every once in a while. I don't want to be crude, but if you're on the commode, you got something to do. You spend at least a little bit of time sitting down every day. Read it. Before you go to bed, read it. And I should have six or seven hands raised up for Sunday. As it says, it goes on to say, thoughts of peace and not evil to give you an expected end. This should take away fear and encourage prayer. To know that God hears you when you call on him. Praise the Lord. Amen. We're going to go on with the service. My lecture is over. Now I can preach. Anybody want to hear the word tonight? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Let's stand and pray. We're going to pray for this service. I think we need to wake up a little bit. Praise God. I'm going to start with Luke 15 and 1. Praise the Lord. Luke 15 and 1 reads as follows. And then we're going to pray. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners. Who's him? 
drew near unto Jesus all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinner, sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, We've already done this parable. We're going to go into another parable. But right now we are hearing Jesus' parables about a burden. Let's pray. Jesus, we ask right now that this church, in the sound of my voice, begin to have this burden, begin to build within their inner parts, that they can't stop thinking about God, about souls, that they get a burden for the ministry, for seeking the lost, for taking those out of darkness and bringing them to light because they are now standing in light, God. We ask you right now, let this church in them create this burden in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. amen. Clap if you love the Lord. Just clap. Praise the Lord, you may be seated. Children, I need you to pay attention. I need you to sit down and face forward. Very good, very good. Thank you. We have wonderful children in this church. We appreciate them. In the book of Luke, remember we've been talking about a burden for a while. We've been talking about the parable of the talents that showed that there needs to be a burden for us. We need to be living with that burden. And the parable of the talents shows us that. Romans shows us that Paul talked about wanting to or be willing to actually trade himself for his brethren uh, so that they could have God. That's a burden. Someone who says that I'm going to take place of someone else as a sacrifice. That is a burden that Paul had for the kingdom of God. Um, we go on to hear about uh, the sheep, the 99 that are present and the one sheep goes astray and, and what the attitude is towards that one sheep and, and, and what happens when they find that sheep. Uh, there's joy, there is excitement about that sheep coming from being lost to being found and, and then we talk about what heaven and how heaven responds how heaven responds to that person that is lost and becomes found through repentance. Uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to go back through every sermon and see if there's any sermon I've ever done that didn't include repentance. In six years, I'd be willing to bet that every single sermon somehow was involved with repentance. Then we go on to hear about this last one. One, two, three... Four. Ooh, you guys might get out early today, but don't count on it. <laughs> this one, this time it really might happen because I, was, I wanted to finish this sermon before I go to my next. The Word of God reads in, in verse 8 of Luke 15. Oop, poor guy. Luke 15 and 8 reads as follows. You can follow along up there or you can read your Bibles. I feel like i got to come over here. Sorry, guys, but if I stand here, I feel like I'm in the... If I stand over here, I feel like I'm all messed up. But I stand here. It's like right in the middle of the church because you're here. Okay. Either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she loses one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently. Somebody say diligently. Does, is, is, is diligently meaning... Well, you know, I lost it, and well, let me try to find it. Like my kids, they're not diligent. This is my kids. Um, um, I can't, um, 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 I can't find it. They, if, if I'm lucky if they pick up one thing. They go like this. I don't know where it is, and they go about their business. That's, is that diligent? It's not diligent because you're not putting any effort in and you're not going to find what you're looking for without that diligence. We have to have due diligence towards the end, which is to find that which is lost. And so this uh, parable that Jesus is sharing with the people, remember I talked about that, that $100 bill, you know, because to us a piece of silver might not mean much, but if we had a bunch of hundreds and one fell out and started going down the street, because you know how the gallop wind is. You ever drop something? Oh, Lord. And you, it has to be valuable for you to be ah, running after it, right? Because you know you got to run. Because that wind is so bad. So if, if you chase after something that you lose in this gallop wind, it must be valuable. 
And if you're carrying a bunch of hundreds, you just go to the bank and, and, and one, whew, are you just going to say, oh, it's just a piece of paper. Oh, I got nine others. I'm good. Man, you drop them nine hundreds in your own pocket, you go. Right? I don't care how fast the wind's going. You, you, you might leave kids in the car. Y'all sit still, don't move. Pew! Because it's valuable to you. Well, there's a parable that, that talks about that same analogy that I gave last week or the week before about that value. You're going to seek diligently till you find it. And it's not just looking diligently and saying, okay, I looked and I looked hard, so I'm done. It says, look diligently until you find it, which means you don't quit. You know, I love some of this military mentality where they don't leave nobody behind. Period. That's it. You know, if someone's down, you're going to go get them. We don't leave our people behind. We should have that same mentality in the church. We don't leave our people behind. Someone is down, we're going to do our best to help them. Now, if they don't want to help, there's nothing you can do about that. But we are going to do our best to reach out to those that are fallen and say, I will not leave my brothers behind. I will not leave my sisters behind. And that's the same mentality this woman had. That she's got these coins and one is lost. But she is going to do whatever she can. She has ten pieces of silver. Verse 9. And when she had found it, now if you look hard enough, come on, I'm going to preach this. If you look hard enough, you're going to find it. Because you know where you're at. You're in the house. And you know that it's in there somewhere. I'm going to give you an analogy. Today's society, there are lost everywhere. And they're there. You just got to find them. There is somebody that wants God bad enough to come to the house of the Lord and repent, get baptized, and receive the Holy Ghost. They're there. You, they're there. We know they're there. It's there. You just got to go find it. And you got to look diligently. Because it may not be in the first place you look. Let me give you an example. Sister Mo came up to me today. And she had done her best to witness to somebody. And they didn't come to church. And she said, what else could I have done? And me and Anita said at the same time, Anita was sitting there as I said it, nothing. Once you have done the best that you can to find that person, if they're saying, I'm not that person, then you don't, okay, look, you're coming with me. You don't take them by the neck. You don't push them, get behind them. Get in the car, get in the car, you're going to church. They're going to think we crazy at that point. Oh, don't go to that church, they won't let you go. They're going to lock you in the building. She asked me, what else could I have done? There's nothing else she could have done. She did everything she could. She went back and picked that person up. They were walking. They didn't have a place to go. She said, hey, why don't you come to church? And they said, no, I can't go in that place looking like this. And so she said, you, it don't matter what you look like. You come anyway. But sometimes people make excuses. It's not, just, it's not to care what they look like. They just don't want to go and they're going to give you a bunch of answers until, and then, oh, I, I've got things to do. It's funny because you can tell which ones are just saying that because they don't want to go because you'll take away that reason and they'll come up with another one. And you'll take away that reason and they'll come up with another one. At that point, you've done the best you can. The person doesn't want to go. They don't want to go. But does that mean you quit looking? That is not being diligent. Being diligent means I'm going to keep looking until I find someone. And once I find someone, I'm going to try to get them to the house of the Lord. I'm going to go find somebody else. Because in this situation, you're not done when you find one. That one coin in this parable stands for all of the lost until Jesus comes that you're going to encounter. And you've got to try to find those ones that will come to the house of the Lord. And just remember, somebody did it for you. That's why you're here. That's why if you've repented, got baptized, got the Holy Ghost, and are making a commitment to live a godly life, that's why you're going to heaven. Because if you're doing those things as a result of being brought here, then that's why you're going. Because somebody reached out to you. And I think that's why God is so serious in the parable of talents. That's why he's so serious about the fact that you can't just get that and just walk away with it. I got saved. <laughs> I'm saying I'm going to heaven. <laughs> we'll see you later, man. I, talk to sinners for what? I'm going to heaven. 
I don't want to be around those people. They say this, they do that, they act crazy. I don't want to be around that. I want to be changed. I want to be around godly people. You don't understand the gospel. What did it start out with? By saying that Jesus was hanging out with sinners. There are some churches that literally have this completely backwards. They don't want anything to do with the people who are lost. Because they're too much trouble, they're too much work. I want, hey, we're just going to have our little group. And we're going to praise God together. And we're just going to sing unto the Lord and love Him. They don't get it. And there's a good chance they might not even make it. And I'm not judging. I'm talking about the Word said. Because it says if you don't go out and increase your talents, there's a place for you and it's not heaven. So not only is it important for you to get a burden. Oh, come on, somebody. I love when this comes up. Listen, not only do you need a burden for others, for others, you need a good burden for others for you. Because without that burden, someone may need to have a burden for you. And then you're going to be in trouble. And I don't have any problem laying it to you straight. That's the way this church is. And that's my responsibility. I can't do any less than lay it out the way Jesus does. Or guess what? I'm in trouble. And I'm not willing to sugarcoat it for anybody just because I want people to be happy and come to church. I want you to be happy and come to church because you're willing to follow him and what he says. If you're not happy with him, then you better check yourself and figure out what's wrong with me. I'm not happy with him. I need to be happy with whatever he says and willing to do it and willing to move forward in my maturity in God. Who praise the Lord. So we're going to find the lost. We're going to seek until we find it. We're going to look diligently. If you witness to one person... In a week, have you been diligent? Let's, let, let's talk about it. How many people do you come in con contact with in a week? If you come in contact to 50 or so people in a week, and you've only asked one person to come to church, that is not diligent. And I don't care how, how nervous you get. I don't care how, you have, how much you have to come out of your comfort zone. Uh, and I'm, 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 I'm talking, you know, I don't care who it is. You know, I don't care how scared you are, how nervous you get. <laughs> you are still responsible you have to learn to walk through that nervousness because it's not diligent to just ask one you know what I have cards on me I've got I've got I carry at least 10 cards a day and it's so easy I just hand them out I'm at I'm at that's my wife I'm at the drive through they ask for the credit card I hand them a church card you keep that one. Let me get my card. But that's one for you. That's, check it out. Come check it out. When I buy something at Walmart, I hand out a card. I, if I got a waitress, I hand out a card. It is so easy. You know, and I make it real easy for it. You don't have to do a whole lot of work. Just hand it out. Say, hey, there's a website on there. You can go check out the services without even coming. See if you like it. It's real, real easy. Now, it's hard for some of us because we may not be outgoing. So what are you going to do? Oh, come on. Remember the parable of the talents? What did the guy say? Are you going to go to God and say, but, but God, I know you required of me because my pastor told me, but I was scared and I was shy. And I'm, I'm not really good at talking to people, God. You made me that way, so God, you got to accept me. Good luck with that argument. Because what did the guy with the parable said the same thing? I knew you were a hard man, but I was fearful, so I just hit it over there and just left it. Now you can go get it. Didn't even have the courtesy to go get it for him and present it to God. This is, this is serious business. And you know, some people could be watching and say, Oh, he just wants them to go bring people so he can have a full church. And he can say he's got lots of people. So they can bring all their money and all that. I don't get none of it anyway. Money cannot be my motivation because I'd be a really poor businessman. Because I don't get no money. I don't get a check. I don't get, uh, I don't receive the tithes of this church. It goes into the building. So understand. My motivation is not just to have a lot of people. If I wanted that, I could just be, I could just preach simple stuff like, Oh, just love God. Just love Him. It's just about love. Oh, Jesus. If I, if I didn't push repentance... Because I was afraid that more people would leave and just say, you know what, just come as you are. It doesn't matter what you do. It's all about Jesus. Isn't it crazy to say it's all about Jesus but not live according to him what Jesus is all about? That's why he says in the book of uh, Luke, um, I think it's chapter 6. He goes, why do you say Lord, Lord and not do what I say? If it's all about Jesus, then we have to be all about his business. 
And his business is to have a burden. Now, are we going to have people? We're going to have people just by the nature of the fact that we've got a good church. We're going to fill these seats. I'm not even worried. We filled them and people have come and gone. We're going to have church. But it's not just about having church. It's about doing Jesus' will. It's about doing what he asked and then letting him bless the church. Are you with me? It's Wednesday. We tired, huh? Anybody tired? Raise your hand if you're tired. I was tired before I got here. I'm not tired anymore. You know what? If you're tired, maybe you didn't jump and shout enough before church. See, wait a minute, Pastor. That don't make sense. If I, if I jump and shout, I'll be more tired. No. What happens with people when they go to the gym? They get tired before they go to the gym. They go to the gym, they feel better. So the more you give, the more you get. Doesn't that sound like a biblical principle? You get what you give? Come on. Praise the Lord. So in verse 9, it says that when she had found it, she called her friends and her neighbors together saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace that was lost. You know where revival comes from? You know where revival comes from? Revival comes, and, and we need some of this in here. We've been having, we're a revival church. We've been in revival in this church for literally six years, starting in April. April will be six years at the end of April. We've been in revival the whole time, but let me tell you when we've had the strongest revival, what strong revival is all about. Strong revival is about people coming to repentance. Remember we talked about in the last, when it talks about the, the sheep that was lost. It says that the angels have a rejoice when one comes to repentance. It's going to say the same thing in a minute. I'm going to show it to you. There is a rejoicing that takes place when someone who is lost repents of their sin. Because it's such a big deal. Just, just the fact of being willing to say, you know what? I, I, I'm done with my sin. It's caused me so much trouble and so much pain. And I'm so sick of being, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired from what the sin is doing to me. So now I'm going to say, God, I repent and I turn from my sin. And I'm going to dedicate myself to be diligent to stay away from sin. Do you, that is one of the most miraculous things that can happen in church. People are in church, oh, I want a miracle, I want a miracle. We see miracles all the time. When people make that decision, even if they don't stay in church, at least they made that decision at some point that they can start building a foundation where they know where to go. Because when when, some people have to go, about, go back out and get their misery refunded. And it's out there. You can, you can have a refund anytime you want. The devil is outside doing push-ups. If you want to give up your repentance, God said they're saying, come on, come on home. Uh, I made a bed for you right here. Oh, look at all the food. Look at everything's right here for you. Anything you need, the devil's got it for you right there. If you want to go back, you can. Oh, but not me in my house. I'm going to serve the Lord. You need to make that decision, keep that decision, and you will see revival in the church continually. Mm, praise God. Isn't it awesome to see someone in the altar weeping and crying? And, 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 and you know what? I don't mind seeing people in pain. Because pain is that motivator that makes people make that decision. I'm done with that life. I'm done with that life. So that's where the rejoicing comes from. You have found something that was once lost. It's now, it was out of God's hands. Now it's in God's hand. When it comes to a soul, it, God created that soul. And he created it like Adam and Eve to live for him. But it's out there in the world living like the devil. It's lost. But when it comes back into his possession, it becomes found. And there's something to rejoice about. Just one soul. Just one soul. It doesn't say you have to have at least 50 people for the angels to rejoice. It says when one soul comes to repentance. Now remember it said that back here. Where is it? Mm -hmm. Okay, where is it? We've already heard it once. Rejoicing when something's found. Here it is in verse 7. I say to you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner. Right? It goes on to say it again. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to do that too. 
there's still the level of rejoicing. Verse, I know it's there, but okay, there it is. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels. Now this is in the same portion of scripture. And the same thing is being repeated to you to give you an understanding that there should be a burden for this. That when one person comes to repentance, it doesn't say 10 or 50. It says over one sinner that repentance. There is joy in heaven in the presence of the angels over one sinner. Does God need a bunch of people? Does God need a hundred? Does God need us to fill this church tomorrow? No. I don't mind filling this church one soul at a time. One family at a time. Having people create a party in heaven. You know, every time we come to church, I want to create a party in heaven. And I can't do that unless we reach out and try to bring the lost into the house of the Lord. Then we can have a party. Man, I tell you what, when Sister Shauna came back, she walked through them back doors, and, and about, it was about a couple of, about six months after you started coming to church, she walked in the doors, I just about burst inside. You don't know, when someone's gone and they come back, it just brings such joy to me. And I'm just a man, imagine the angels. So who wants to, have a, who wants to create a party in heaven? Who wants to create a party in heaven? Who wants to motivate the angels? Who wants to cause the angels to dance? Who wants to cause the angels to rejoice? I do. I want this church to cause parties on a regular basis in heaven. But it's going to take some effort that's done diligently by the church. So we can't just want a party in heaven. We have to do what's required to create a party in heaven. Wanting it's not bad enough. It's the same thing I tell people who are addicted. Wanting to get clean is not enough. I'm working with a person right now who comes here for Bible studies and they go to Fisher's Church for church and then they're work I'm their recovery coach. It's a new name that I've created for what I do. And and I told her very clear, she goes, I want to be clean. I said, That's not enough. I want to be six feet tall. So I can be tall, dark, and handsome. I have to stay tall, medium, and handsome. Wanting is not enough, though. Unfortunately, I can't do anything to grow vertically. I can grow this way. I can grow this way. I can certainly grow this way. But in order to get clean or to stay clean in terms of drugs, alcohol, or any sin, you have to do the work. That's why the Bible says in James chapter 2 that faith without works is dead. You can believe God can do it, but if you don't take the action that God provides, then nothing is going to happen. And then we want to blame God. Why isn't it changing? Because you haven't done the work. Praise God. One last story, and we've gone over this one pretty well, so I didn't write them all down, but it's, it's, it's relevant. We've gone over a little bit of it in this church. Who knows the parable of the prodigal son? Who's heard that? My wife knows it. You'll, you'll probably know it. I'm going to describe it as the story of the prodigal son. So that in the future, if you ever hear that, you'll know what it means. So you guys probably already know what it is, but you just don't know what it's called. Do you remember what I preached about the gentleman who uh, left and squandered his dad's riches? He asked, he said, God, God, he pr I'm sorry, he prayed and begged his dad to give him his inheritance early. And he went and spent it. And lewd women and drinking and partied and crazy and ended up, you know, working in a, as a slave almost and starving to death and eating uh, out of a pig trough and says, wait a minute, this is what, this is what I call the, the wake up moment. He says, wait a minute, the servants in my dad's house eat better than this. So I need to go back home and beg daddy to take me back. I need to say sorry to daddy. What is that called? That's repentance. I need to say sorry to my dad and say, uh, listen, I'm not worthy to be with you, but if you'll just take me back, I'll be your slave. Do you remember that story? Okay. He said a certain man had two sons. That's the father. Verse 20, I just told you all that part. But this is the part that's relevant to this sermon is the idea of dad's response 
to that repentance. Dad's response to the son's understanding that he blew it and he had it better where he was. Listen, that's the same way it's going to be in sin. You go back out to your sin, you're going to realize I had it good when I was with my daddy. I had, my life was wonderful. You know, I was telling the same girl the other day, what people do is they come to God, get their lives turned around, their lives get great, and then they want to go back and stop doing the very things that change their life and think their life's still going to be the same. That's not how it works. I wish it was, you know, just like my eating. My eating, I'm, I'm going to start praying about my eating. I, I want, I'm getting bigger because I'm working out, but the belly's staying the same. So now I'm just gaining weight because muscle weighs more than fat, but I'm not getting rid of the belly. And I need to pray for, for uh, diligence and commitment and, and, what's the word I'm looking for? Temperance and, oh, be, there's another one. I can't think of it right now, but temperance is a good word. Uh, you know, being, being someone who is um, dedicated. I'm not dedicated. I like to eat. <laughs> My wife, I wish you were a bad cook. That would help me, you know. Why don't you start cooking bad? Put a lot of salt in everything. I don't like salt. But understand, we are in a position now where we have it better with God. And we think that we can stop doing what got us healthy and then life's going to stay the same. It's not. We have to understand how we got to where we are. There are lots of people that love to go back and think things are going to stay the same. That's a lie from the devil. He wants to convince you that you can maintain the life you have without doing what you did to get there. Praise God. So the father's response is what's ideal to this understanding of a burden. Dad had a burden for his child. If he didn't, he would have said, hey, let me tell you something. You went out there and wasted all that stuff. You know what? Don't come back here. Go on. You want to be gone? Go. And there are parents that do that. Because they don't have a burden for being that parent. It takes, it takes a burden to be a father and a mother. Anybody can create a child. That's easy. But being a parent, this one right here, how old is yours? Huh? Two years old, she said, mm -hmm, Pastor, I know I gotta be diligent. Oh my goodness. She got a two year old. I got a two year old, too, girl. I'm with you. I know. I'm like, oh Lord. You gotta be diligent in order to be a parent. You gotta have a burden for your child, or you're just gonna neglect your child. Okay, God has a burden for us. And anytime we want to reconnect with God, God's sitting there, just like the father in this story of the prodigal son. Verse 20 it says that he arose and came to his father. But he was not yet, he was, he was yet afar off, a great far off. His father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Can you just imagine? His son's gone. He doesn't know what's happening to him. He doesn't know if he's okay. He, he, he knows that he has gotten himself in some trouble possibly. But he sees him coming and all he has is joy. There are some that would be angry. How dare you leave for so long? How dare you do it? Aren't you glad this church is not like that? Why? Because we have compassion for people. People can leave this church, go back into the world, they come back here, and they can get hugged. I ain't going to kiss you or nothing. Just, I'll kiss the guys, but not the girls. <laughs> he's, he's like, what do you mean kiss the guys, pastor? Yeah, you read the Bible? It says, greet your brother with a holy kiss. <laughs> They're like, we ain't going that far. <laughs> but we have compassion. If you could, be, you could be out there for five years messing up, doing everything wrong, and we'll still hug your neck when you come in. If you're a girl, I'll give you a side hug, because that's how I do it. Tap your head on my little grandma tap, I call it. Oh. It's called compassion. We have a burden for souls. The people who are here have a burden for souls. But we need people who are here to not just have a burden for those that come back. We need to go get some more. We need to, there's, there's hurting people all over this city, everywhere you go, and we have a God here, and we have a power here, and a gospel here that can deliver them from their misery, and they can smile even when they're having problems and have that peace that passes all understanding because we have a God that's compassionate, and therefore we're a church that has compassion. We need to be like God. We need to be God-like. We need to be like Christ. What do you think Christian means? Drives me crazy. People call themselves Christians and act like the devil. They should call themselves satanic. Let's just call it for what it is. If you're going to live for Satan, then don't call yourself a Christian. Call yourself satanic. 
until you repent then you can call yourself Christian but the fact of the matter is we need to be like God in this church and God has a burden for the lost so in this church we're gonna have a burden for the lost praise the Lord it goes on to say verse 21 let's stand I didn't get you any earlier <laughs> Same amount of time, but I've still been good. I've been getting out by 8.30, y'all, so y'all can be, be good to pass from. Buy me a cookie. Chocolate chip. See, I'm already thinking about food. That's just a mess. Verse 21. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and, I'm mo and no more worthy to be called thy son. This is the attitude that a person has who is lost. There are people out there that don't think they're worthy to come to church. That woman that Mo was talking about is one of them. I'm not good enough. I'm not, I'm not clean enough. We have to be the, vo the, the, the mouthpiece of God. We've got to be the verbal ones to go out and tell people, you are worthy to come into the house of the Lord. God wants you. You're not that far from God. You're just a repentance, baptism, and then filling of the Holy Ghost away from being a child of the King. You are not too bad to come to church. Praise God. And finally in verse 32 it says, it was me that we should make merry and be glad for this day thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is now found. The brother was complaining, but wait a minute, I've been sitting here doing work while he's out there wasting the money and I kept my inheritance, I didn't waste it, and you're going to cook a calf for him? He said you should be excited that he's found. He was lost. But now he's found. You could be in church for years and someone go out and live for devil for years and come back in the church. They need to get, yes, we need to throw them a party. We need to love on them and pull them in. Yes, you've been here all that time. Good for you. But this person is what God's focusing on right now is the lost, the person that needs him. That's where we need to put our energies and our efforts. We still love you, but we got to put our attention and energy on the lost. Last thing I've got to say that I believe the Lord just told me to say is that if you're in this church and you're still lost and that's a possibility you're in this church and you're still lost either you haven't initially repented been baptized or received the Holy Ghost or you have but you can't maintain your repentance which means that you're lost if you keep living in sin after you've repented baptized got the Holy Ghost that sin needs to be repented of and the Holy Ghost will cleanse you of that sin according to Titus 3 5 you get the washing and the regeneration but if you're not there you need to call me I will have compassion on you I will not sit there and say oh really well you've been sitting listening to my service all this time and you still in sin what's wrong with you that's not compassion if you call me and say, Pastor, I'm struggling with this. I'm still doing that. I can help you. But I can't help you if you don't talk to me and get me involved in your situation. And there are some people in this church who think I don't know. I'm here to tell you, I know. Don't think it's hidden or a secret. I know. Listen, I'm just, can I just be real? I'm, I'm feeling the Holy Ghost right now. Can I just be real? I, if you were to come to me and say, Pastor, what do you, where do you think I'm at? I bet you I could be 99% right when I was to tell you where you're at. Whether you're low on the end of your faithfulness in the middle or high or if you're just flat out in sin. And it doesn't make me, uh, it's not like hocus pocus. It's not give me a card, I'm going to read it for you. Which one you got. You can see it in your walk. I don't have to catch you out there doing something. I don't have to see you walking into a liquor store. I can just watch you as you walk in this room right now. I've been around apostolic faith for 14 years. And I've been in and out of church in those time periods. Uh, uh, 14, 30, well, all except for one short period of time where I relapsed. All that time I've been in church. I know what it looks like when someone's living for God. And I know what it looks like when you're not. So you're not fooling anybody. Call me and say, Pastor, there's something I need help with. And I will help you. I won't think less of you. I won't judge you. I've dealt with rapists, murderers, child molesters, alcoholics, drug addicts. 
wife beaters. I worked with I worked with uh, husband beaters. Had a couple of them. There's not much that you're going to bring to me that's going to surprise me. You're not far from God, but you you you. You still don't have God if you're not where you need to be. Praise the Lord, we're going to pray. I'm going to leave you with that thought. I need to reach my shepherd if I'm a lost sheep. I need to reach my shepherd if I'm a lost sheep. What is, what is a sheep without a shepherd? Rack of lamb? Barbecue lamb? Mutton. <laughs> a sheep without a shepherd is dinner. So you need, you know, don't think that you have a shepherd if you wander spiritually outside of the realm of the spirit and think that you're still in, under the pastor. You're not. Can I, can I just say one more thing? I know I'm on a roll, but can I, I've been standing this whole time, so you stand there for three minutes, ain't gonna bother me one bit. Can I tell you something? Technically, now don't mean I don't love you, because I love everybody in here, even the ones I don't know that well. But technically, I'm not even your pastor unless you take my direction. I can't be someone's pastor if they don't let me lead them. Now don't get me wrong, you come in here, you call me pastor, that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. But technically, in order for you to function as a Christian person, you have to take direction. I do. I got a pastor and a bishop. I got a bishop here in town. And I got a pastor back in Texas. And I got several other men that are in my upline of covering. So if you bring something to me I don't know how to deal with, I'll go get the help to find out what to do. I'm only going on for those extra five minutes because it means that much to me to help you find heaven and to make heaven your home. Can I get an amen? I love you. I love this church. And I want to see everybody here make it to heaven. Let's pray. Who Jesus. We just got heavy towards the end. But I believe that your spirit. I believe that your calling. I believe that your will. That your church know what it needs. God, let us receive this word without bitterness. Without anger and frustration. But understanding, knowing what we need. For each individual person. God, we thank you, Lord, for this beautiful church and these beautiful people. Get us home safe tonight and back to church on Sunday, safe and sound. And let us leave this church with a burden for the lost. In Jesus' name. And the church says amen. Oh, you got to be louder than that. We're talking about souls. Somebody say amen. amen. Praise God. You are dismissed.